Thank you for joining us on this episode. Today on the Myopia Podcast, we're joined by Dr. Justin Kwan to talk about how he went from private practice to being Cooper Vision's myopia guru. Justin is a 2009 graduate of Berkeley, and he went on to do a contact lens residency at SCCO. Justin taught and saw patients there for eight years before moving to Chicago. In April 2020, he transitioned to Cooper Vision full-time in the role of Senior Manager Myopia Management. In his 12-year career, he has given over 100 hours of continuing education. We're excited for Justin to be joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thank you again for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. As stated, we are here with, uh, with my good friend, Justin Kwan. And Justin, thank you for joining us for the Myopia Podcast. Yeah, happy to be here, Dave. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, so Justin and I were discussing about uh, somewhere around 11 years ago, he and I were sitting around <laughs> a table during his residency, and we were just talking about uh, the future and what was next. And uh, fast forward here, Justin has has uh, you know been a huge part of academia. He's been in private practice, and now he's got this new role. So Justin, why don't you share with us a little bit about this role that you have with Cooper Vision now? Yeah, Dave, I'm just so blessed and fortunate. Um, I think back a little bit, maybe a year and a half ago, right around my site's FDA approval, I get this text message uh, from my Cooper Vision rep back in Southern California. Yeah. Of course, we had worked closely at the school, just like with all the other reps that come through. And as chief of the contact lens clinic at the time, you know, built a great relationship. And so even though I had moved away to Chicago and, and joined a private practice, um, he and I still kept, you know, in relatively close touch. And he told me I'm sitting next to Dr. Michelle Andrews. They're making a brand new position um, on the eve of my site's FDA approval. And I looked over the job description. Justin, I think you should apply. You check a lot of the boxes. And in my mind, you know, I've always looked at industry as I would miss patient care. Uh, but this is one of those things, Dave, where you just can't let this go by. You got to put your hat in the ring, right? When else are you going to have the first and only FD approval? So um, I applied. Six uh, interviews later, you know, got a job offer and uh, joined the company right in the middle of COVID. It was April of 2020. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, you and I have educated audiences of optometrists, students, and everything in between. Uh, so I look at my role as still a lot of education, which is great. Yeah. You know, I went from 100 SECO students to now 170 sales reps and our 48,000 colleagues, right? And that's just uh, the tip of the iceberg. So I'm really excited to use multiple platforms to continue educating, uh, driving that awareness, as you and I know, is uh, yeah. so, so critically important. So Cooper Vision has been building out this team of people in the in the myopia world, oh, yeah. right? Cooper Vision has uh, the Paragon products uh, yes. once they purchased Paragon, in addition to MySight as a product. And so yeah. it, it seems as when I look at Cooper Vision, I see a lot of people with the word myopia in their job title. So mm -hmm. can you mm -hmm. kind of lay the foundation for yeah. uh, what, what roles people are doing and what you are doing? What is it that you're, you're responsible for? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I just got credit, you know, Al, Al White and Dan McBride and the whole leadership team, like unbeknownst to me and probably to you, yeah, probably five, over five years ago, they had planned, uh, they saw this future coming. Yeah. And that's when Paragon CRT, as you said, was acquired by Cooper Vision around 2019. And uh, since then, a, a couple more acquisitions and joint ventures have you seen in the press, I'm sure, with uh, the OrthoK lens design called IC by GP mm -hmm. Specialist, uh, yep. this wonderful lab in San Diego, um, and as well as you know the joint venture to uh, take on Sight Glass Vision, the spectacle lens yep. uh, that should be launching in Canada in mid-November. Right. Um, but right. Uh, in the U.S., we can't get it soon enough. But as you and I know, it takes a bit of time. <laughs> Um, so thinking about or our organization, it is a little bit complicated, right? So 
We know that our sales reps uh, do wonderfully with your biofinities, your clarities and my days, right? Uh, but they also have those relationships to kind of bring myopia into the picture for each of their doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, but what Cooper Vision did is we uh, took on and uh, brought on what we call myopia management specialists. Yeah. Uh, Dave, think about these as uh, certified opticians, perhaps a uh, lead contact lens tech, um, an office manager, a coordinator. So they came out of practice they're not ODs, uh, but they really have that kind of office environment experience and the mindset of how to get the whole team, the staff, the pre-testers, the receptionists, everybody on board with myopia management. Um, and we know it's standard of care, but at the current moment, it's still kind of looked at a bit of a specialty sort of thing. So we know it's easy, but it's not easy at the same time. And so we have eight of these currently, eight of these myopia management specialists, and they yeah. work intricately with um, our Cooper Vision sales reps. And uh, I interface with them a lot too. Uh, and uh, they have a high level of the, the science understanding, but also you know the practical day-to-day -day things, which I think mm -hmm. is so, so important. Cool. Um, and, uh, and and I know some of these people. They're they yeah. are fantastic. They're people where it was kind of like, oh wow, you've left clinic and now you're you know helping yeah. in other areas, and it's kind of right. been this uh, yeah. other role. So yeah. I'll, I'll get back to my same question, Justin. What do you do? Yeah. <laughs> so it is so uh, varied and diverse, which I appreciate, right? I mean, that was this, uh, some of the cool things about teaching as well, right? You can do a little bit of clinical research, a little bit of lab, lecture, clinic. Um, but in my role here, um, I'll spend a few hours a week just kind of reviewing uh, marketing assets, whether they're a sell sheet or a digital or a social media type thing, making sure all the peer-reviewed references are there, they're accurate, the wording is just right. Um, as an example, we tend to like uh, to call these children with myopia as opposed to myopic children. Um, small things, which, you know, could be meaningful. Uh, you know, people always say we don't want to call patients, diabetic patients, because we don't want to let that disease define them. Yeah. Whereas Tim Edrington would said, don't call them keratoconic patients, patients yeah. with keratoconus. Yeah. Yes. And so that's just one example of many on how wording matters. And just, you know, working with Michelle Andrews and working with uh, Jane Ogmontayan, our brand director, um, with the messaging, making sure it's simple and reviewing even things like our posters, right? Uncorrected myopia, what does that look like? Making sure it's accurate and it's compelling. Um, all those things we've learned and research um, about, you know, not using scare tactics per se, but still driving the urgency and the concern. Um, so I'm in a lot of meetings, like maybe four to six hours of meetings uh, a day. Um, and then just a lot of just projects, a little bit of content creation, um, and my job is 50% travel. So I'm on the airplane a lot uh, as you know the country's opening back up here. Uh, so just got back from a new grad event, which we were so pleased to be in front of 65 graduates from, there were 19 of the 23 schools represented, really helping them kick off their career with my site, Paragon CRT. And we brought in a couple of the ODs on finance guys because uh, we knew that was important for them mm -hmm. uh, to hear from that, that type of content, as well as uh, Cooper Vision's wellness coordinator. So really, we know work-life balance is hard. I'm sure you're uh, a witness to that. Um, and then maybe there's no such thing as balance, but we wanted to make sure these uh, new graduates uh, are, are healthy in, in both physical, mental, emotional and those things as well. So it's a lot of event planning, I'd say, Dave, yeah. uh, but a lot, of, a ton of education. Yeah. So you, uh, you, you were at the school, then you went into yeah. private practice, and yes. now you moved yeah. over. What, uh -huh. uh, what area of optometric practice day to day <laughs> do you miss the most? Oh, uh, Dave, it's going to be just meeting like 16 new people a day, right? And catching up on life and getting to know their families. And, um, you know, you and I with specialty contact lenses and myopia, we get to see these people like four times a year sometimes, right? And, and with dry eye as well. So I miss like the specialty training and the clinical practice we've gotten and the reputation we've built at uh, our respective institutions and having people, you know, come from near and far to, to see us and because their disease is that much more complex. So I, I do miss the dry eye and the, and the sclerals and so on. <laughs> yeah. So there yeah. had to be something appealing enough yes. to leave that. 
What is it that your role is providing to you now that most fulfills you and gives you uh, joy? Dave, I think a lot of industry people will say, um, and I agree, uh, that, you know, our impact is now greater, right, Um, from seeing 3,000 patients a year, now indirectly through all of our colleagues just um, seeing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of patients indirectly. And I, I, you know, when I was teaching and we had those fourth year students that were kind of considering residency, I'd always push them towards cornea and contact lens because, uh, you know, we, that's where we get to make um, an immediate impact uh, with vision correction uh, for irregular cornea and such, but also to treat the most prevalent eye diseases, right? Uh, you have refractive error, you have dry eye, um, and in myopia, that is the most prevalent disease that our profession gets to treat in our lifetime. So I think that was the draw for me is like, yes, I'm going to have to kind of sunset my dry eye and sclerals a little bit, but to take on such a big issue and a, like you said, a global problem here, um, this is the most prevalent thing. And uh, it, it's a big uh, thing to take on, but it's the right thing to do. Right? Yeah. You know, I think uh, one of the things I've appreciated about you is uh, even from the beginning with teaching is you always were about helping other people become successful. Yeah. And uh, look at the audience that you have now, as you even stated with the um, 160, however many sales reps or whatever it was, yeah, yeah, 48,000 yeah. optometrists is really by and large, your role is now educating us to help us understand this impact that uh, having myopia has on these children. I wanted to touch on something that is a real big strength of yours, and you already alluded to it, and that is communicating with uh, our staff and communicating with parents. And when we as myopia management uh, you know, experts communicate with other professionals, what are some key aspects that you think uh, are best practices? You were in practice. Yeah. Now you've got to, de- you get to dedicate all of your mm-hmm. uh, professional endeavors, helping us to be better at doing this. What are some things, you know, I think this myopic child versus a child with myopia is is one big thing, is helping to not define them. You alluded to scaring tactics, (laughs) right? Yeah. So what are some things that you could kind of think of, uh, you know, uh, that you've picked up that could help us? Yeah, Dave, timing cannot be any better because about a month ago, we wrapped up some parent research. So pre-COVID times, these would be the focus groups where you'd be like that one-way mirror, right? You'd have like four parents in a room, a moderator, and then Cooper Vision sitting behind the mirror. Well, of course, it's done through Zoom now. Uh, We still get to kind of be a fly on the wall there. So it's great because you don't have the doctor influencing what the parent will say, the moderators like, you know, tell us the good, tell us the bad, you know, what was your experience like with your doctor? Uh, so you'll be glad to hear it was very positive. Um, yeah. At least 80% of them said, you know, I just trusted what my optometrist prescribed and told me. I didn't need to do any extra web searching or ask a friend. Um, I just said that was enough and I want to help my child. But really cool thing is you, you know, that we have an education binder Um, that you can use, you know, if you want to, it can sit in your exam room. Um, The second page actually just shows a longer eye and a shorter eye. And for the parents, it wasn't a real eyeball, it's just a diagram, but it was enough for them to say, I don't want that longer eye. So sometimes that is enough. And for us, uh, I've learned to say that, you know, of course, myopia is not just a number, it's not just thicker glasses year over year, really the eye is longer than it should be. And to steal a line from Paul Karpecki, then follow that up with, this is concerning, right? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of doctors are missing that this is concerning part. Um, And then they go into recommending the three options, right? Um, So we do have to prescribe with authority, but I've also learned from folks like Steve Vargo that at times you need to read the parents and kind of empower them to make uh, a good decision, the best decision for their child. So, you know, inserting a question here or there is like, how do you think nearsightedness impacts your child, right? And then they'll have that aha moment, or you can at least guide them towards that instead of you trying to force something uh, down their throat, so to speak. So Mm -hmm. I think the approach is varied because there's just like 
countless parent types. <laughs> We've seen them all, I think, right? And um, it's funny when some doctors will be like, you know, when you meet that parent who has that type A personality, and you just kind of know they're going to call you at 11 p.m., I'm going to steer them away from ortho K. <laughs> um, so that's just a humorous example, but we yeah. know that my site's FDA approval carries huge weights. Uh, yeah. And these parents, some of them did, you know, know somebody that was in clinical trials or somebody did post on Facebook and said, any other moms out there, you know, using my site. Uh, but in large part, they just trusted what the doctor said. So I think mm-hmm. saying, mm-hmm. Um, you know, myopia is the eye is longer than it should be. This is concerning. We used to just have to watch this get worse, but great news. We now can do something about it. So mm-hmm. that's usually the 20 second version uh, before yeah. we set aside some formal time to walk through things more thoroughly. Yeah. So the, uh, the, the conversation, what kind of conversations do you think need to happen with the child? We, we often yeah. forget about the child, right? Oh my goodness. Yeah. So Dave, um, you know, we really have to engage the child, right? Because they're the ones wearing the device and if they don't wear it, they're not going to get the treatment. So I really like to ask them just like we do for all our patients. Um, what did they do um, outside of school or during school? Did they do sports, right. dance activities? Um, you know, these kids also have very busy lives and I try to get a glimpse into their life so I know where contact lenses can be beneficial for them because quite honestly, this is the long game so they could care less about their myopia yeah. being slowed down, uh, but they really uh, don't know yet uh, all the benefits that contact lenses can offer. Um, so, you know, we've always done the glasses fogging with the masks, but now as, you know, we're opening back up, I try to get a feeling for, you know, um, what do you do when you first wake up, right? Um, Hopefully they'll say they reach for their glasses. Maybe not if they're a lower RX. Uh, but after school, you know, do they play outside? Are they on the playground? Do they do like family walks, right? So you kind of get at the outdoor time a little bit. Um, but I really want to make sure that uh, for, in sports, for instance, that they really would appreciate getting their full side vision. And as a, let's say, baseball player, right? You have to look out of the corner of your eye to spot that pitch, right? And I can tell them contact lenses can help you do better there. Um, And lastly, I do want to put a trial soft contact lens on their fingertip so they get a feel that it's really soft and squishy. It's not hard or irritating or uh, intimidating, I guess you could say. Um, So that can be really helpful as well. Yeah. And, you know, I think a a good question I've found success with is, are there things where you wish you didn't have to wear your glasses, right? And you use the baseball analogy, putting a putting a helmet on over the top of glasses can be (laughs) a little bit uncomfortable, right? So are there times where you wish you didn't have to wear your glasses? um, And a lot of kids will come up with them. Some of them like their glasses. And so that conversation doesn't happen. And then the other one is uh, if their prescription is a minus two or a minus three, uh, a good question to ask them is, do you remember when you used to be able to take your glasses off and still kind of see? Um, And so kind of alluding to, we want to make it so that your eyes don't keep keep getting worse Uh, and and bringing that to their awareness because, you know, they don't, they don't care. They have to put glasses (laughs) on, but if you bring them back a year or two, depending on how old they are, that doesn't work for a five-year-old, but bring yeah. them back a year or two of, do you remember when is like, yeah, you know, I used to be able to take my glasses off and still kind of be able to see, but now I can't, right? And even well, we want like, to make it get worse. Yeah. And even bringing it back to the parents without creating too much strife, it's kind of like talking to the both of them. Like how many times a week do you misplace your glasses, right? And with yeah. contacts, you just put them on in the morning, take them off at night. And, Good to go. Um, you know, parents are starting to count like, oh my gosh, lenses got scratched. Oh my gosh, like frames were broken. And it starts to add up in their mind too, which I think is a good yeah. uh, pivot point yeah. to uh, move towards myopia management. Yeah. So the last question that I wanted to ask you is about finances, right? So Cooper Vision is having to bring... Uh, a conversation to primary care practitioners around the country and around the world that they haven't had to have before. You know, when it comes to a year's supply of a daily disposable lens, there is a premium cost to going into a MySight lens. There is this premium that goes to the management of myopia. Mm -hmm. How, How are those conversations? Some of our listeners may be new to myopia management. Many of them Mm -hmm. are established, but 
how do we walk through the conversation of cost and value with patients yes. and maybe more importantly with practitioners? Yeah, I'll start with the practitioner's mindset, right? Because you and I know there was a period of time where we were all fitting two weekend monthlies <laughs> and then to move to a daily disposable was a bit nerve wracking. Like, I don't know if my patients will pay for this. And we've gotten great at communicating the value of a daily disposable. Mm -hmm. So now this is, of course, taking that a step further and thinking about this as a medical treatment, right? And for me personally, I go see the chiropractor once every two weeks and I haven't met my deductible. So that's about the cost of myopia management as well. Certainly I'm an adult, right? Um, but for children, there are other, you know, maybe health needs, uh, hopefully not, hopefully they're as healthy as can be, um, or other things that a parent just has to plan for, right? Whether it's the traveling baseball fee, bringing it back to that, um, or other activities that just, you know, they aren't free, uh, even if it's through the park district or what have you. Um, so I think mean, that's helped me as a parent as I've made kind of budget decisions for the family. Mm -hmm kind of think about that aspect uh, from medical and just your basic things that you just got to pay for. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this program approach, you know, thinking about anything north of $1,000 is uncomfortable for a lot of doctors. And I think if we communicate to the parent as a program fee, giving them that monthly fee cost is, is uh, less sticker shock than the annual program fee all at once. Mm -hmm. Now, how the credit card or FSA card might get charged could be a different amount, but you know, you can just in the exam lane be like, this is going to be about 150 a month for usually a minimum of two years. But as we watch your child, you know, grow and progress and hopefully not change in their myopia, we can adjust along the way. And that's the beauty of the program. So give mm -hmm. them a little certainty, but we have to give ourselves some room uh, in case um, we just have that fast progressor in the chair. Yeah. And so that's usually how I like to do it in the exam room. And then, of course, we have to train our staff in the bookkeeping aspect of it, because whatever payment system we use, whether it's the MySite app, which happens to break things down over nine months with a down payment, or whether it's like, um, you know, a care credit, scratch pay, Sunbits, you know, those are other systems available as well. Uh, we just have to be clear on how that's accounted for on the back end, right? And I think that's probably the setup thing that, you know, most doctors are like, oh, another thing to do. Um, but I'd say that as we did our math, like over a four to six year period, Dave, um, myopia management is about three times as profitable as selling a year supply of daily disposables. So that can't be taken for granted. Uh, so Dave, I don't know about your office, um, but you know, some doctors will mandate you know, a, a new pair of ortho-K lenses year over year, and some will just check for deposits and treatment effects with topography. Um, but either way, um, you know, the year two professional fees largely goes down in a lot of ortho -K practices compared to year one. And if you compare that side by side with my site, actually my site tends to generate more revenue despite the higher cost of goods. And not a lot of doctors look at the six year window and divide back down to annual. Mm. They just look at year one and compare side by side. So yeah. that's something that we are uh, now have a tool available for doctors to kind of think about their chair cost, what they currently price things at and get that six-year outlook and divide back down to the end. Yeah. Is that a tool that's in the MySite app, or is that something on the website? Is that something we can share yeah, with our it's, listeners? Um, yet to be released. It's almost ready, uh, but it's available through your myopia management specialist and that training platform called MySite Pro. Mm -hmm. The MySite app is kind of strictly for patient management and right. ordering. Right. Yeah. So MySite Pro. So, is where uh, the five lesson certification and all yep. those post-certification resources live. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we will link my site pro in Perfect. the show notes. And um, depending on when you're listening to this, this resource probably yeah. <laughs> will be available. And so you may want to go look at that and just look at uh, profitability and yes. uh, the benefits over time. Well, Justin, I want to be uh, cognizant of our time here. We, we did talk longer than we anticipated, which isn't a surprise to me. <laughs> Uh, so much great information here, and I know we're going to want to circle back on my site and circle back with you on some of these uh, topics, particularly the finances and so forth. Um, thank you for joining us today. It's sure a pleasure yeah. to pick your brain. Yeah, thanks, Dave. And I'll just tease one last thing. Yeah. Um, if you're able to join us at the Academy meeting this November in Boston, um, we will be unveiling the seven-year data 
uh, of the MySite studies, which remains the longest clinical trial uh, for myopia and for soft lenses, uh, we imagine as well. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Thanks so much for uh, having me, Dave. It's been a great joy. Always great catching up with you. Thank you, Justin. And thank you, the listener, for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe. Uh, stay tuned for additional episodes. Uh, by subscribing, you'll automatically get hooked in with the latest on myopia. And if you would be so kind, we would love a five-star review from you so other people know that this is the place to go for my, the Myopia Podcast. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.